record button. And okay, so hello everyone. Thank you for joining Impact at CIS for the Equity Economy Workshop this evening. We're honored to have Ed and McKinsey from the Foresight Lab joining us today. For those who are not so familiar with Impact at CIS, we are a student group that offers CIS students with support on impact-oriented projects while creating a space that nurtures integral leadership and creativity in order to build and sustain a community that thrives on transdisciplinary change making. Our three pillars are salon gatherings, speaker series, and workshop events. Before we, be we begin, just two housekeeping notes. Um, this is a public event. We have people joining us from outside of CIS and we are recording this event, so it will be available for the wider community and for those who are unable to be here today. So just to keep in mind that this is not a private event. If you have questions throughout the workshop, please use the raise hand feature. Ed and Mackenzie don't mind getting interrupted, so please don't hesitate. And our workshop hosts, Ed and Mackenzie, have designed tonight's workshop within the time frame of an hour and a half. However, all the material that they are sharing would usually be taught over the course of a semester. So although the workshop will end in a timely manner, Ed and Mackenzie will stick around until 7 p.m. or so if any of you would like to continue the dialogue or have any other questions. So that's it from me. I'm going to hand it over to my co-organizer, Carrie, who will introduce our workshop hosts. Thank you, Sonia. So I am um, here to introduce Ed and McKenzie tonight. And the reason being is because I first met Ed about 10 years ago when I was in my graduate program for business, um, getting a master's in business at Presidio Graduate School. And Ed was my teacher there for my final semester in Capstone Project. So that's where we first met. Um, and Ed is the founder and the head of practice of the Foresight Lab, and there he leads regenerative design. He is um, working on a variety of very interesting projects, including with a variety of cities, including Ferguson, Charleston, Minneapolis, and Atlanta, on reimagining the police, um, as well as doing some interesting projects with Fetzer, with the World Bank, the United Nations Development Program. He has a philosophy degree from UCLA and also a law degree from UC Berkeley. So we're delighted to have Ed here tonight and I think you'll really enjoy his energetic, empathetic and um, energizing way, to, way of presenting. And then his co-presenter tonight is Mackenzie Mako. Um, she is the senior program manager also at the Foresight Lab. And she's working with a variety of interesting clients as well, including Kiss the Ground, BMW Works, um, design, excuse me, BMW Design Works USA, the Fair Food Fund, as well as Suez Environment. And McKinsey is studying right now environmental science and she's hoping to move on to international diplomacy work after graduation. So I am delighted to uh, introduce both Ed Cometo and McKinsey Mako for our workshop and engagement tonight. And I'll turn it over to you all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carrie and Samia. It's a privilege to be here. Um, we very much uh, appreciate the opportunity to share uh, some hopefully useful ideas with you. Um, and um, how many do we have on the on the call so far? We have ten total so far. Okay. In that instance, what I'd like to ask is um, if you would quickly go around the virtual room, popcorn style, which is to say. Whoever wants to go can go and briefly tell us your name and your program of study so that we can try and aim our remarks at the audience that we have. And um, so with only 10 of you, I don't think that'll take very long if each of you take just, you know, a few seconds to say your name and your primary program of study. And Violetta has been kind enough to begin that by giving that to us already. So thank you, Violetta. How about Michelle? Why don't you go next? Michelle Murray, and I'm at uh, Philosophy, Cosmology, and Consciousness at CIS. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Whoever wants to, wants to go next can go, or, or Michelle, you can also just try calling on someone, and we'll do it that way. Yeah, time. exactly, exactly. Hi, um, I, I'll go. My name is Robin Miles, and I am in the Transformative Studies PhD program. Thank you. 
Hi, my name is Nancy Mincius. I am a first year PhD student in anthropology and social change uh, program. And sorry, I can only stay for uh, one hour. I do have an alternative uh, econ class uh, that starts at 6.15. No worries. This is an apology free zone. So no worries. Thank you for joining for the time you have. I'll go next. I'm Josh Hogan's and um, I'm also in the philosophy of consciousness and cosmology program too. Thank you. Hey, my name is Abir and I studied in the philosophy of cosmology and consciousness program. Wonderful, thank you Abir. That doesn't quite look like 10 to me. Get Nancy. Uh, I already went. Yeah, okay. Nancy did go. Um, I think that that's it. I think, Carrie, you were including us when you said 10, right? Oh, okay. That's, that's right. Fair enough. Good deal. Well, thank you all for joining. And again, I just want to reinforce, we very much want to be interrupted. And, and uh, so please stop us as and when you have questions and we will pause and, and ask them. Just raise your hand and and uh, we'll flag you and, and, and uh, go. Let's go back to the first slide if we could. So one of the rules of PowerPoint is don't waste the slide. Uh, we're not gonna waste the title slide. We were very intentional in coming up with the name. Naming of things is very important. And so we thought about this and we thought about uh, CIIS about which I know I'm privileged to know a number of your faculty and I've known people uh, who graduated from your program going back quite some time because I go back quite some time. Um, and so we thought about this title and it is very much that we, as you'll hear, we at the lab do not do small work and we are possessed of the view that our duty as change leaders in the current system conditions that we find ourselves about which I won't say much or we'll get diverted, um, must be about shifting the global economy at scale. It is not enough to work around the edges. Long has passed the time when it was sufficient to do innovation in small, interesting ways. In the early days of teaching sustainability, which I was privileged to be around for in the mid 90s when sustainable development became a topic in progressive business schools, that was enough. As you will all know, that is sufficient no longer. Um, and so building a global economy of equity, transforming it to deliver doses of justice and peace with every transaction must be our work. And as we said in our call to this session, and as we'll repeat during McKinsey's conversation, um, that's the work and that's why we use this title. So, um, good. Small scale would be sufficient if we didn't know that in 20 years, 20 years, most of the ecosystems that support life on the planet are going to be gone. That is to say, unrecoverable. We've already lost fisheries. We're very likely to, to lose the um, uh, marginal ecosystems like um, estuaries. And we're facing a situation where the upstream from estuary montane environments, rolling hills that sit between oceans and large mountains will also be lost. We don't have a choice. Nature is looking at us and saying, this is a bad experiment. People talk sometimes about, oh, we have to save the planet. The planet is gonna be fine. The, 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 um, the, casualty of our misuse of resources is going to be our species. So the time for small is gone. The time for dramatically large is on us, which is why we do the work we do in the lab. So I hope that answers your question. Um, and if we go to the next slide, please. Hey, Ed, before you keep going, we had two other people join us. So I just want sure. to give them a chance to say hi. Yes, Fearon, please. Thank you. If Fearon and Emma could just say hi and say what program that you're in. Hello, actually it's uh, Sarah and I'm in the TSD uh, program. 
Thank you, Sarah. Someone else? Uh, I think they may have jumped off now. So I okay. think we're No worries. Um, I just wanna say that um, what I'm gonna say tonight is uh, peripheral. The primary message is gonna be carried by my brilliant colleague, Mackenzie Mako. Um, and so what I want to do is make sure that I keep my remarks to a minimum so that she can deliver her content, which is really the centerpiece of what we're gonna talk about tonight. So thank you, Mackenzie, for joining us and for your good work. So we can go to the next slide. So this is just the contract we made with you. Um, as Carrie will remember, I take syllabi very seriously. So we're gonna teach to the syllabus we put together. So that's why this slide is here. Next slide, please. We've done this, so welcome all of you. We can go and talk about this. So um, the second big rule of PowerPoint is never read your slides. So Mackenzie and I will generally not break that rule tonight. You're capable of digesting what it says here. And the reason it says this is because we do not have challenges in front of us that any expertise can attack. And anybody who tells you these days at any scale, from a national leader to a local government official, to a consultant, to a teacher, that they have the expertise necessary to solve these problems, they are selling you something. What we're going to talk about is where the solution set to these wickedly complex social, ecological, and economic problems that we face comes from, and it is dramatically not expertise. Next slide, please. People get wrong all the time what is meant by inclusion. The corporate lingo of diversity and inclusion is a falsehood. It's a way of masking doing substantive justice and equity work in a corporate cloak. So we would recommend that you deposit that terminology in the dustbin of history and embrace the ideas of equity and justice, which are substantive, eternal, and to quote the words of Martin King, the long moral arc of justice is slow, but it always bends towards the truth. And if we ever experience in our lives moments when injustice is there, we simply must take the long-term view, grit our teeth, and get it right. And we don't do that by passing new laws, as we'll talk about. Uh, next slide. Oh, sorry. Oh, between equity and equality. Good, really good question. Equity is a way of being. Equity is a system condition of life. Equity means that from each according to their ability to each according to their needs is real. Equity is about whether a country can say that every last citizen has the greatest opportunity to fulfill her destiny, not to make a living, not to have a house, but to fulfill her destiny. Equality, on the other hand, is what happens if you have equity. If you don't have equity, equality is a dream. I hope that makes sense. Really good question. Um, this workshop is intended to give you the beginning of the equipment you will need to do the work of social change in a world which resists change with its every energetic erg of being. Change doesn't consist in small things. By the way, extra credit if somebody can tell us who Barbara Jordan is. Anyone? There's a lot riding on this because I bet my colleague that none of you would be able to tell us who she is. So the, a very expensive dinner hangs in the balance. Anyone? This is really the question of who can Google the fastest. I'm very- Yeah, that doesn't count. <laughs> Yeah, that's a good point, but that doesn't count. Barbara Jordan was the second African-American woman to serve in the United States Congress. She was elected from the state of Texas in the 70s. And when a Democratic African-American woman was elected to the US Congress from Texas in the 70s, it was tectonic. 
And if you haven't watched her performance during the Nixon Watergate hearings, you need to Google it and watch it and listen. Because this woman is one of the greatest leaders that nobody remembers. She was Martin Luther King combined with Harriet Tubbs combined with Michelle and Barack Obama multiplied by Indira Gandhi. She was extraordinary. And I recommend that you watch everything you can by this incredible leader who unfortunately very few people remember. Next slide. Um, does anybody know what this is? It looks like a fire hurricane. Or exactly, extra credit, extra credit in my class. And since I don't give A's, you need every ounce of extra credit you can get. Um, that is the north side of the Mayacamas, which is the range that runs between Napa and Sonoma County. That used to be one of the most famous wineries in the world. Um, this stuff is real and it's never been more real. I, for the first time in my life, flew from a state with a statewide state of emergency caused by climate conditions to another state that had a statewide state of emergency caused by climate conditions when I flew from California to Iowa to be with my colleague Mackenzie uh, in the midst of the wildfire season and after a derecho storm blew through um, Cedar Rapids, Iowa. This is some serious stuff that's getting very real. Next slide, please. I'm gonna hand it over to McKinsey now for the most important part of our conversation. So I would recommend that you attend her carefully. Ms. Mako. Perfect, thank you, Ed. And before I get started, I think we do have a new guest here. Weston, would you like to um, introduce yourself and, and tell us what you're studying? Oh, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, I realized my mute was not on as I joined, so apologies for the sound that may have been coming through. Uh, I'm at the PCC uh, PhD program, finished my coursework, I'm into my first comp exam. And uh, yeah, I'm intrigued by, uh, by the work that Samia and team are putting together with the Impact series. Cool, thank you for joining us. Okay, so let's start with the Industrial Revolution where we became dependent upon non-renewable resources, based our infrastructure on them, and formed an emphasis on mass production to feed our ever-growing population and economy. So let's pretend it's the 19th century and we discovered combustion of fossil fuels helped us create machines that would then help us create even more machines for our own amusement. And we could create hundreds, thousands, hundreds of thousands, or even millions of products at rapid speeds before our eyes to supplier demands for newer and better technologies. The economy has created these consumeristic societies that numb their woes with cash exchanges for products based on non-renewable resources. It's a sort of manifest destiny for consumption. Um, but when we think about it, like certainly most of that money flows back into the economy, right? But if we think about it, it's not really a flow at all, but more of a straight line into wealthy pockets investment accounts and maybe even offshore banks. So the economy should make us more human, caring, empathetic and well off in ways that creates well-being, not only in our societies, but for the environment as well. But instead we have an economy that creates a divide between the upper and lower classes where the middle class is filled with happy and fat people that are distracted uh, by um, the amusements of the 21st century. And the middle class is this sort of shock absorber that protects the very few rich at the top from those many below the middle class. So if we think about it, what is the economy for? It was structured and designed, regulated and controlled to make the few wealthy at the expense of the many for the sake of amusement and distraction. Because if that's done well enough, then everyone is distracted and they can keep doing business as usual. At some point, however, the titans of industry, predatory bankers, complicit co-conspirators, elected officials and regulators around the world who are responsible for this economy 
couldn't get away with what they were doing any longer. So let me tell you what happened in 1972. The Club of Rome, which was composed of policy and business leaders from around the world were curious about this phenomenon and, and what was happening. They were seeing where economic growth led almost inevitably to ecosystem collapse and didn't understand why. They even saw this happening in developed and developing worlds. So they then commissioned a study for high learning institutions to bid upon uh, to start this study and MIT won the bid. Uh, the study was led by Jay Forrester, Dennis and Danella Meadows, and their two research partners alongside them. They studied the system dynamics that ran the global economy. They predicted that that was the population, markets, finance, consumption of non-renewable resources, and demand for food. They created this World 1.0 computer model with differing scenarios um, based on these factors. Nobody had previously looked at these complex interactions before, but these MIT researchers did, and they used a complex set of extrapolated scenarios that projected into the future to see what would happen if we continued to consume, grow, and expand the economy at the rates in 1972. So this projection forward of patterns helped them create these difficult feedback loop graphs, like they're like so tiny, like such tiny dots that have arrows going back and forth that you can't even zoom in and see what they say. It needs to be like broken up. It's, it's crazy the feedback loop graphs they created um, that show the positive and negative relationships between these dynamics. Uh, they then published the limits to growth in 1972 with their key conclusions. And Somi, if you could please go to the next slide. Thank you. So I won't, I won't read this quote to you, but it was pulled straight from the book and I'll give you a second to read it. So the authors noticed that the filling of these sinks cause the system to have to throw even more into it to continue that same level of output. And given that preliminary prediction, they then gave us an idea of where things would go with this next quote right here. So, Meadows and company saw that growth in industry was unsustainable and our ecosystem would not be able to supply us and contain us for forever. And we would have to manipulate our markets to counteract that. We would then see that our ecological and financial systems would collapse, then leading to economic collapse. And remember, they wrote this in 1972. So we can see here in this slide that their predictions became right in 2008 where the economy suffered not a complete collapse, but a stark jolt and just a taste of what Meadows and company predicted would happen. This collapse was driven by artificial manipulation of capital markets. The destructive beast of our economy got so high that it couldn't be sustained without strains on our natural systems and ec economical manipulation. Living beyond our means by the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment is also included in here because it was published right before the collapse of 08. And it basically reiterated and restated some of what Meadows wrote about. Um, but in here, scientists examined the conditions of 25 major ecosystem services that support life on the planet and what would happen to them if we continued to neglect it. So isn't it great that we learned from this and changed our ways to prevent a repeat of this collapse and we embraced everything written in 1972? Obviously that didn't happen. Um, so let's think about this. I mean, if, if maybe people would have listened back then, we wouldn't have gotten to 2008's collapse and where we are today. But why is that? Why did no one listen and why did nothing happen? You can go to the next slide. So we believe that this short quote in response to the limits to growth by Elliot Richardson um, provides a pretty good example of that. 
you can click through on this slide so that it builds fully, please. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the last thing should maybe be a picture. There you go, perfect. Oh, if you could, if you could go back, thank you. Let's let that slide build and just sit there for a minute so that okay. you can absorb it. One more. There you go. Perfect. Right. So the people would not be able to understand what was in the limits to growth. And it was too complex for them to do anything about it. So they literally did it. And this is where we are now. So there's good news and there's bad news. The bad news is it's only getting worse, but the good news is, is that there was an organization put together in 2017 to bring this issue to light once again. And that is the Foresight Lab. The reason the lab was put together and the way it was designed is to change all of this. We seek to be the leaders um, for those like you who are awake and see this issue and want to change. We believe we are the leaders in this field and we were not only designed to get at the problem of horrible economical management, but also the catastrophic social justice problems our country faces today. We solve these very problems in a different way. And we were made to be a social change creative agency as well as a civil rights law practice. Um, I will hand it over to our colleague, Ed, to talk about the skills we use in the lab that we believe will aid us in solving the world's most difficult social, ecological, and economic problems. Um, but before I do that, are there any questions that I can answer for you guys? Do you like that? Oh, good. You can see me. Thank you so much. Mackenzie, thank you. Uh, this was very eloquent and grounded in research. Though I have to object to the last quote, which to me comes across as blaming the victim type of approach. Mm -hmm. uh, the minds of the people, says somebody who is evidently um, by his very position, um, not referring to the community that he would associate himself with. So the minds of the people that are different from the position that he's speaking from, now he goes into unprepared to accept. And then political readership that these conclusions would compel, in that sense, disregarding the political leadership with accountability that has created these con this conditions. So it's convoluted. It goes, you know, it's crisscrossing the lines of possible transformation. And, uh, more detrimentally, it's putting the blame on those who A, might not have recognized accountability for bringing about the conditions, and B, might not have, uh, you know, accountability for moving moving ahead as the system describes, as Richardson describes. That's my commentary. Uh, I would pose it as a question if you would like to comment, uh, especially in terms of the trajectory of your presentation so far, which is, it was bad, it's been so bad, here is what we envision a solution. Because if solution is along these lines, then we need to clear up the, clean up the lines. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really important point. And I mean, before I answer that, I, I bet Ed, Ed looks like he's jumping out of his seat to answer that. You do? <laughs> <laughs> oh man, Mackenzie, I don't know how you do it. Um, I will say a couple of things and then I would welcome your feedback. Okay. This is why I love CIIS. I mean, that is a brilliant intervention, Violetta, and I don't say those kinds of things lightly. As Carrie will know, I'm very cautious with my praise and easygoing with my criticism. Um, you are right and you are wrong. You are right for every reason you said. I think I would offer a thought that maybe there's something because I'll give you a bit of context. This gentleman was one of the most brilliant selfless leaders this country has ever had. You might know, if you remember your history, that Elliot Richardson sat at the top of the Department of Justice at a time when Richard Nixon thought he could get away with virtually murder in this country. And Elliot Richardson was the first man to stand up and say, I'm not gonna fire the special prosecutor. And so Richard Nixon fired him in what came to be called the Saturday Night Massacre. He also served as the ambassador to the UN and did brilliant work there. 
And the reason his quote has purchase is because of the unique kind of democracy we have in the United States. It has never been the case in any movement of social conscience in the history of this country from the revolution, which was the move, first movement of social conscience, to the current street, hmm, the current democracy that expresses itself on our streets around issues of social justice. None of those have been instances where the political leaders have led us out of the darkness. It has always been the case that the will of the people in this amazing experiment leads the leaders to make it impossible for them politically to ignore these problems. And that's why this quote is here because Elliot Richardson knew to a fairly well that the only thing that was gonna get this to change was the people rising up and telling the politicians, we will not tolerate your complicity in this global criminal enterprise that we call the economy. So great point, absolutely right, but also a little bit of truth in it. Great, uh, contextualization really helps. Thanks, Ed. Absolutely. Mackenzie, anything to add? Yeah, I mean, like I said earlier, um, people were being distracted. And so I think because they felt nothing was wrong, that there was no reason to change anything. Just a simple way of putting it, but. No, that's, that's very elegant and true. Any other comments on McKinsey's excursus before I continue? I was just wondering if, you know, within the uh, Foresight Lab, uh, anybody holds this perspective that the economy creates distractions, but I wonder does within your lab, do you believe the economy creates things that are not beyond just distractions or is there the sense that the economy exists just to create distractions? Oh no, that's a, another brilliant question. Uh, Mackenzie, you wanna go first or you want me to? You got this. Okay, so I mean, obviously, clearly it's the, the question answers itself. Our advancements in medicine, our advancements in the ability to increase the food supply so that people have access to food, our advancements in quality of life on some level, they're to be applauded. The problem is those are peripheral to the primary purpose of the economy, which is to narcotize us so that we are amused and distracted in the middle class and we don't rise up in our numbers and force the change that is needed. Um, as we'll talk about, we're at a particular moment in this country when the chance for change is real. And I don't mean the kind of small-minded change that we've seen. We have failed assiduously for 400 years to take the most fundamental steps to break the back of this monstrous problem of social justice. We think passing more laws, more regulation, better training is gonna fix it. It's not ever. And we'll talk about the things that are necessary for that to change, but the economy has done great things, absolutely. I mean, you know, people have a standard of living, we live longer. The problem is that's peripheral to the main play. Thank you. Of course. I would agree with that, Ed. Great question. Anybody else? Before you continue, we had one person join us. I'm not sure if I'm saying your name correctly, but Giannis, do you want to just say hello and say what program that you're in? If you're able to talk. If not, it's okay. Okay. Well, we'll assume right. that she can't participate right now. No worries. Thank you, Carrie. Okay, well then we're gonna march bravely forward. Thank you, Mackenzie, once again. Uh, if we could go to the next slide, please. Um, we have to give credit where credit is due. What we're about to talk about is derived from the work of one of the most singular geniuses of our century who was also unknown. The gentleman on the left is President Santos, who is one of six uh, South American presidents to win the Nobel Peace Prize. The first one, of course, was Oscar Arias. 
And if you don't know Oscar Arias' story, you need to look it up because Oscar Arias single-handedly gave the Reagan administration the thumbs down during a period of adventurism in Central America. And at a time when the Reagan administration was doing its best to overthrow every democratically elected government in Central America in the interest of feeding our country cheap produce, Oscar Arias did something outlandish. He's the president, he was the president of um, Costa Rica. Instead of doing what many other people were doing, which is build an army to keep the US out, he dismantled the army of Costa Rica in the middle of this nightmare scenario that the Reagan administration was running and took all the money, it was a quarter of the national budget and invested it in education. And he dared the administration to come for him. And of course, they cowered like all cowards do. They cowered and didn't come after him. And his story led to the creation of the UN University for Peace, one of the most important institutions in our world that nobody knows about. And um, he uh, is a signal person. President Santos did something equally amazing. There was a 52 year long civil war that was waged in Colombia. The well-known cartel situation in Colombia is only one of the many um, symptoms of that war. He put himself to the task of ending that. And he did it in part by meeting with the gentleman on the right, who is a simple, quiet, humble, avuncular man named Adam Kahane, who as you'll hear in a few minutes, is one of the most important peacemakers the world has ever seen. And no one knows his story, unfortunately, at least not enough. He is my mentor in this work. I joined his agency, Rios Partners, and spent three years doing battlefield peace negotiations to learn how humanity's most complex problem at that time was being solved so that I could bring those tools to bear on these other problems we're gonna talk about. And I was privileged to sit at Adam's table for three years. Um, so I just need to give credit where credit is due. If you haven't watched Adam Kahane's uh, YouTube videos, you should watch every one you can consume because although he is a quiet, thoughtful, peaceful man, he is one of the most powerful forces for transformative social change that we've ever had. Um, next slide, please. All right, does anybody know that flag? Extra credit points. South Africa. All right, Weston, you're gonna pass this class. Nice work. Um, in uh, 1970, no, 1968, Nelson Mandela was arrested and he spent the next decades in a horrible nightmare of a series of prisons in the second to last apartheid regime on the planet. At the time, South Africa, which was colonized by the Dutch, had spent 342 years under the thumb of the most brutal, overt, signally evil political regime that has probably ever, um, oh, thank you, good work of here, um, graced the, plate, the face of the planet. However, it came to be that because the people of South Africa wouldn't have it, eventually the political will of the abjectly ignored majority forced Pit Bota, who is the last president of the apartheid regime, to release Nelson Mandela from prison. Two years before that happened, the brilliant young men and women who would become the African National Congress got in touch with Adam Kahane and said, look, when President Mandela is released, there's every likelihood that our country is gonna to burn to the ground. And diplomats and presidents and policy leaders and business leaders in those days of the early 1990s all were sure that that was going to happen. There was every reason to think that that country would descend into a nightmarish failed government and would wind up the way Somalia is today. But for the fact that they had the wisdom to call Adam Kahane, who at the time was a strategist at Royal Dutch Shell, um, ironic that he worked for the biggest oil company in the country that had colonized South Africa. 
but he was a strategist. And they said, we've heard about your work. We think you're the guy who can help us prevent this from happening. So Adam went to South Africa and convened what was called the Montclair process. That is a resort in the mountains above Pretoria. And Adam pulled together the political leaders of the most brutal apartheid regime in the world, the political leaders of the African National Congress, and every other civil society organization he could find to sit together and try to muscle their way through to a future that wouldn't lead to the inevitable, which was the destruction of the country. And what he said then is what I say now about our work. We make our money when the stakes are high, the odds are long, the chips are down, and we have zero margin for error. That, my friends, is the work. If you're not doing work in our time on social change, where the stakes are high, the odds are long, the chips are down, and you have no margin for error, you're not doing the real work. And that's the work that Adam took on in his quiet, avuncular way. In the next two years, led by Adam, the country formed a peace and reconciliation commission to open up the wounds of 400 years of colon colonization and brutalization and spent those years talking about it openly in forums throughout the country. 14,000 forums were convened and they just listened for two years while Nelson Mandela was being prepared to be released. And when he was released, two years later, an election was held. And those of you who know your history or like me were around then, will recall that it looked like the election worked. And a lot of people were like, huh, that's remarkable. It was more than remarkable. It was against all odds that a peaceful transition of power occurred. And I have to say, the African National Congress are no angels. There has been uh, fraud, there has been um, bad behavior, and uh, the current president of South Africa is still with the ANC and he's no angel either. However, what's true is they made it through the wormhole of change because Adam Kahane saw a way and the only way to do it was to open up that wound and talk about it for two years and just listen to the pain and the agony of those who had been injured and to force the business leaders and the political leaders who had executed that oppression to sit and listen. I mean, imagine that. And when they were done, Adam had the wisdom to say, all right, we need to underpin this process by putting in place an institution of civil society to carry this work forward forever. So they passed a law to create a truth and reconciliation ministry to continuously cultivate a healthy culture within the country every single day. That formula is largely unknown. As we say in some circles, it's below the waterline of the iceberg, but it worked. And it is the only time in human history where that kind of system condition was unraveled successfully in a way that to the 60th percentile, because it's not a perfect world, created a future for that country. And as problematic as the ANC has been, it's been a pretty remarkable history. So that's the first application of these skills that we want to talk about. If we go to the next slide, and again, please, questions anytime. Now is the chance for you guys to do some work. I'm about to give you a prompt, and it's going to be a prompt that will make the hair on the back of your neck stand up. But to get you there, I'm going to tell you a story. We did the work of peacekeeping in Ferguson and in Charleston <clears throat> it's always sort of hard to talk about this but um, we did the work of peacekeeping that we had learned on the battlefields of Africa when I just said to Adam after three years in Rios I'm going to take this work home because my country needs it 
And so my first exercise in this was in Ferguson. And I don't need to say much about Ferguson. It's now written in the tablets of our cultural history, what happened in Ferguson. But I'm gonna tell you a more recent story. I was sat in my little suburban home on the peninsula on Memorial Day this year, doing the work with Mackenzie of social change and continuing to forge the lab forward in our work when I got a phone call from Adam. And he said, Ed, you need to get on a plane and get out to Minneapolis, turn on your television. And I did. And I looked and I saw what was going on the night of the 31st of May, a Monday that I'll never forget. And he said, I'm sending Joe McCarran, who is the head of Rios's uh, Oxford office in the UK. And you need to meet him at the airport and figure this thing out. Um, so I did what I do. I, when the situation occurs, you get on the plane and you go to Minneapolis and you meet your colleague, Joe McCarran, and you sit for two hours in the arrivals hall and figure out what you're gonna do. And in the motorcade on the way from the airport to City Hall on the 1st of June, I had to figure out what I was gonna say when I walked into the conference room where Jake uh, Fry and his team and the governor of the state and the mayor of St. Paul and a few other people were sitting waiting for somebody to help make sense of this. I mean, I had been around this horse. That was not my first rodeo. My boots were worn and my spurs were dusty and my ropes were frayed, but I still had to figure out what to say because you can never do the same thing twice. This is not heuristic work. There is no formula. So I wanna ask you for a minute to embody that experience. If we could hit the next slide. That's Jake Fry, the brilliant young mayor losing his composure at a press conference during the time that we were there, trying to explain what they were gonna do and execute on a plan that we dreamed up for him. And he's magnificent. They gave me a gift when I was there a few weeks ago. Um, it, it, it moved me, they gave me a little book. Uh, it was a book um, about the civil rights movement in uh, the 1960s. And it was a series of speeches by political leaders that led up to the passage of the Civil Rights Act. And the inscription just said, from a grateful city, your helpful words have been useful. And it's one of the most important things I've ever received. But I was a bit player in this drama. But I want to ask you a question. What would you have said if you had to walk into that conference room and you had about 10 seconds to do three things, gain their trust, say something useful, and give them something actionable to do to dig themselves out of this nightmare, because that's exactly what I was confronted with. Now, since we're teachers, Mackenzie and I, we're gonna ask you to do an exercise, and we're gonna be quiet for a few minutes, and we want you to think and reflect and maybe even journal about what you would have opened your mouth and said. And when you're done, a few of you telling us, I'll tell you what I said, not because it was right, not because it was useful, and not because it made sense, but because I sort of owe it to you to tell you if we're gonna make you go through this exercise. So we're gonna have a few moments of quiet here while you do the work of students uh, and, uh, and think about this, please. Can I ask a clarifying question, please? Of course. Ed, thank you so much for clarifying what the utterance should have accomplished in terms of purpose. I mean, you've said gain their trust, you know, do something useful and, and you know, make sure that there is actionable outcome. But could you tell me about the purpose of the, of the person in, in, uh, uh, in, in question, meaning which outcome are we envisioning? What are we- Excellent. Excellent question. Our commission, our commission, what we were asked by the governor and the mayors of the two cities to do was to figure out a way to bring peace and to permanently fix the problem that had expressed itself the night of the 31st of May. That was our commission. Thank you for asking, I should have said that. Okay, 
anybody else has any clarifying questions before you do a little bit of thinking and writing and deep looking into your inner soul um, for answers, ask them now or otherwise we'll be quiet and uh, let you think for a few minutes and then we'll take a few of your suggested answers. And as a teacher, I'm good with awkward silence, so take your time. Okay, a couple more minutes here. All right. Um, I told you at the beginning, this isn't small work, it's not easy work, and if it doesn't really, really strain your every erg of human being, you're not doing the right work to achieve the level of change we need in the world. So um, I, uh, I'm curious to know, does anybody have uh, an answer they'd like to share? We would welcome it. And look, I'm gonna be honest with you guys. There's no right or wrong answer. I mean, I don't claim to have any expertise because the next time I'm asked to do this, I'm gonna have to think of something else. So I'd love to hear from a couple of you, please. I'm not above calling on you, so, you know, we can do this the easy way or we can do it the hard way. Hey, it's Weston. I've got a question for you. Sure. Actually, uh, the first one was gain their trust. And I, were, did you not already have their trust because they called on you first to come in the door? That, that was, I sort of got stuck on that. Yeah, that's a great question. So Rios has a bit of a rep and so does the lab. But what's true is think about the situation. The trust got us the commission, but that meant nothing if the first thing we said didn't immediately start working, right? If I said the wrong thing, if I didn't hold that space well, if I put a single foot wrong on that first day, None of these people had met me or Joe. We were there on the recommendation of the governor who happened to have met Adam at a conference. And Adam looked at his roster and he said, okay, we need an American, preferably a person of color. So he picked me and we need a really good experienced diplomat who's been doing diplomacy their whole career, which I haven't. So we sent Joe. So, I mean, yeah, yes, but that trust only got us into the motorcade. Once we were in the motorcade on the way to the town hall, we yeah. had to walk into that conference room. We had a whole new game to play, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, that does. Thank you. Uh, sure. You know, the one thing I'd offer then just is to gain trust. Um, you're right. The, the, the bios, the websites, the biographies would have gotten you the, got you the commission. So that gains that initial trust. But you walk in there and you're looking into the, you know, the deer into the headlight eyes of people who uh, so want to believe that you're the one that's going to help them do this and my reaction to that is just saying i'd start with just and i don't know that it takes 10 it, it takes more than 10 seconds but it's like uh, a way to engage and and engage with the humanity of them in this moment uh and uh, you know without without giving them action steps just saying where is everyone where are you what what's going on? It's, kind of, it's something like that. I don't have the right words for it at the moment, but it's about establishing a human connection with the you and the person you walked in with. Just saying, I'm I'm here. I'm with you. You'll figure this out. Where are you now? Something like that. That's brilliant. You might have a future in this work. We, we might have to talk after this workshop. That's really good. Nice job. 
I'm oh, sorry, what was your name? Uh, it's Weston McMillan, thank you. Weston, I might need your phone number later. Um, nice work. Okay, great start. Um, who wants to go next? Oh, I had a feeling you would want to go there, Violetta. Thank you. Yes, especially because you mentioned the job opportunity. So I want a job. <laughs> 64625. Oh, graduate schools are all the same. <laughs> it's all good. Go right ahead. That's the that's the joke part. No, that's uh, good. That's good. I don't have the answer. Here's what I want to share. I know that for all of us in circumstances like this, there are blueprints, some sort of patterns, experiential, intellectual, that we kind of rely to. Um, I would also want to emphasize that it might it might have not been. And in my experience, it, it, it's not necessarily a, a, a one person type of a situation. Implicitly or explicitly, we do things together by borrowing, by stealing, by plagiarizing, by uplifting, et cetera, et cetera, you got my drift. So I just wanna say these situations when one person is put on, stop, on, on, on the spot for good reasons, challenged even, are usually situations when we rely on something that has been a collective process. To that point, the things that I relied on are uh, uh, a little scheme that comes from Harvard negotiation projects, which people might be familiar because of getting to yes, yeah, yeah. which is about the power essentials of negotiation without giving in. Mm -hmm. uh, they based their paradigm on thousands of high stakes negotiations where basically they wanted to look into what being, brings people from the opposite sides to the negotiation table and how uh, how's the process best managed in order for, you know, to get to yes of some sort. They speak about five elements that have to be present in order for any negotiation and for that matter, collaboration to move forward. They talk about appreciation. They talk about a sense of affiliation. They talk about recognition of status. They talk about the respect for the autonomy as well as for the role. So appreciation affiliation can be, you know, as easy as how's the weather today, though usually Palestinians and Arabs don't talk about the weather when they get to the negotiation table. Uh, status, autonomy, and role I'm not going to get into. So that's one paradigm. The other paradigm, and I can repeat or type this five thing is, the other paradigm that I kind of fall onto is I'm a, I'm a counsel on a couple of crisis lines. I, I answer calls from people in distress. One type is suicidal people and the other one is uh, survivors of sexual assault, men and women. Validating, um, reflecting and normalizing is uh, are three of most essential tools in, uh, in, in effective listening, but also in effective, you know, in most uh, relevant tools to establish um, productive base for any sort of conversation, negotiation or getting or meeting somebody to, uh, where they are. Validating is about, I understand that this is something for you, it comes across. Uh, reflecting is also the same lines and normalization is what Wes has mentioned. Uh, you know, it's a situation that can be solved. So yeah. um, I'll rest my case there because I know that I'm missing a million of contextual elements. No, 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 no. no. You're, you're doing great. I th first of all, well, thank you. And um, this is how good classes work. We teach each other. Um, Mackenzie and I know some stuff, but as I, as I said at the beginning, there is no expertise. We are not experts. And, and you, make, you give me a chance to make another point. No heuristic model works. No list, no formula, no combination, no cute little acronym works as we'll get into. Um, but I might as well talk about it now at some extent, because given where we are in the, in the time, I wanna start opening what I said. First of all, before I continue, does one other person wanna weigh in and uh, burning to say what they would have said? I hear crickets and there are the tumbleweeds. Okay, all good, um, all good. Um, There's no good beating around the bush and this is CIIS, so I'm just gonna tell you, one of the techniques is to channel the spirits of our ancestors. They live in all of us. And unfortunately, the Western world has scrubbed that away from us, but I come from a people, the Yaqui of the high deserts of New Mexico, 
And um, I go to the high deserts of New Mexico once a year to channel their spirits and they fill my head with noise and it's a thing. I mean, now I go into boardrooms of big corporations with name brands like Suez Environment, the biggest natural resources company in the world and have to say things useful. And I don't talk that way there because I'm a diplomat. You meet people where you are, but I'm meeting you where you are and I'm telling you the dead level truth. Part of this is reaching into yourself to ancient patterns of wisdom that have woven themselves around the place where our heart meets our soul and where we find answers in situations where nobody has expertise. And that's what I did in the car. I asked Joe to be quiet because Joe's a talker. I mean, I apologize. So am I, sorry for your loss, but, um, but Joe's a real talker. So I said, Joe, I need you to be quiet for the last 10 minutes of the ride. So I gotta get ready because we had decided when Adam and I talked with, uh, when Joe and I talked to Adam the night before, we decided that because I'm an American and Joe's British and because I'm a person of color and he's British, I would have to start. So we have a way of approaching this within Rios that I've brought into the lab and the details don't matter. I tried to channel all of my teachers and the ancient ones who came before me. And I channeled my children and the generations that will come after. And I sat there and I did what I used to do when I taught at Presidio, which is to say a blessing. May the wisdom of the ancients who have lived and learned and the spirit of the unborn who will come behind us and are depending on us to get it right, fill my soul with the ability to be useful today. And I walked into the conference room and it was exactly as you said, Weston, everybody had this look on their face of expectation, fear, anger, um, brutalized worry. There were faith leaders. There were people whose families had lost loved ones to the police department because we told them who we wanted in the room and we kept getting, you know, we didn't have a lot of time, but we kept getting, but, but, and we said, no, put them in the room or we don't do this work. So that's the room we walked into. And I looked at the room and I set down my briefcase, saddlebag, whatever. And I walked over to my place and I leaned in and put my hands on the table and I said, I'm sorry. Because I was. I said, I'm sorry. <clears throat> I'm sorry that I'm here. And I'm sorry that this happened. And it helped that like now I got emotional because it was just true humanity welling up. I said, but I'm also privileged because what we're gonna do here in the next week will be a lesson for every city in this country for how to deal with this nightmare that's been haunting us for 400 years. And we have a choice, brothers and sisters. We have a choice. We can be useful and clear, simple and true. We can love each other enough in this room right now to commit ourselves not to change, to commit ourselves not to small measures, but to commit ourselves to a degree of transformation that means that when the sun comes up tomorrow, this city and its citizens and the family of this man have a reason to think things can get better and they will if we do what I just asked you to do. So I don't know if that's right or useful or true or helpful, but it's, it's what I said. And we spent the next two weeks trying to dig them out. And I won't give you more details because we have, what's the math, 21 minutes, Mackenzie? Um, and we committed to finish. I will reinforce that we're happy to stay an extra half hour because we're only just starting this party. Um, if anybody has any questions or comments at this point, I'd welcome them or we can continue marching through our syllabus. Okay, where consensus equals the lack of sustained opposition, I will continue. I am um, just gonna, sorry, oh, I am just gonna sorry. jump in. Yeah. I, ty typing, it just needs to have a, it needs to have vibration of words and sound, but that was absolutely beautiful. Uh, I'm the the energy of the emotion of of what you sense there is is it, it's coming through at this end. Uh, so I'm feeling it, and I want to thank you for just this this really simple human direct 
as and as V said, acknowledging, validating words. Um, I'm glad this is taped because I want to hear I want to hear that again, and I'm going to write it down. So thank you for that. It's, it was just it was beautiful. Thank you. Well, you're very kind. I will say that if it's any good, it's because of Adam and McKinsey, because Adam uh, taught me well for those three years, and he gave me everything he had. And McKinsey and her brilliance inspire me every day. So from those yeah. who give to those who I shall pass this on to, if I'm any good in the middle, it's because of people like that. So thank you. But yeah. credit where it's due. Um, uh, OK. Let's continue. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so we're going to dig into a bit more detail, but I just want to comment. Was that Weston who just spoke? Yes, that was Weston. OK, thank you. Weston, you raise a really important point, and you help advance the narrative here, because what you felt there, that moment, that was not artifice. I relived the moment, just like I asked you to. I put myself back in that conference room and, re and revisited and reimagined those faces, every one of them. There were 24 of them. Um, and that's how this work is done. There's a lot of context, as Mackenzie said. There's not just a class. We've written a degree program. Mackenzie and I have written a degree program, a two years Master of Science in peace and reconciliation studies that we believe should replace the, the diplomacy techniques that are taught at leading universities around the world. And I'm just gonna tell them, McKenzie, the big play. Part of the reason we're thrilled to do this is because one of the things we intend to do, if Carrie and Somya will give us permission when we're done with this, if this was any good, we intend to approach the administration of CIIS and present them with this proposed course of study in peace and reconciliation studies, because we think CIS is a place where this could and should be taught. But that's for another day. I offer that to you only so that you know the thoroughness which, with, with which we thought this through, and it gives context to these case studies. So we can go to the next slide. So let's talk about a company. We've talked about the hardest, most brutalizing edge of this work. Let's shift the focus. In, 97, in 1996, this was the most successful, profitable, well-respected car company in the world. And they were the only independent car company that was still owned by a founding family. 49% of BMW Group is traded on the DAX, which is the German stock exchange. 51% is held by the Quant family. Um, and it was a pretty groovy company. And I grew up driving BMWs and I'm a car guy and for good or for bad, I mean, yeah, I'm no angel. I don't drive uh, a hybrid. I try to make my impact in the world in other ways. But um, if you go to the next slide, I was sitting in my law office. I was with a big global law firm at the time, minding my own business when a colleague of mine from the UK and a creative agency that I ultimately joined said, hey, we've been asked by BMW Group to do environmental management systems at all their manufacturing plants. They say they wanna be the most environmentally responsible car company in the world, and they wanna be able to measure it and report it. And this was at a time when nobody was talking this way. Today, I mean, I don't need to say anything more, but in 1996, car companies were struggling to meet the most baby step horsey ducky emission standards, except for one. So we spent three years doing that work, and we made them the most responsible car company in the world of their pipeline, which is the production plants. And we went and had a meeting with the CEO and we were done. And I want you to imagine this gentleman, tall, austere, six foot two, a shock of white hair. He had a PhD in nuclear engineering and a PhD in finance. And he was the head of BMW Group, he was the CEO. And a country lawyer from California who grew up in the barrios of East LA is in an elevator going up the building in Munich to talk to him. And I had a moment in the elevator where I'm like, how did I get here? And what am I going to say? Because what he had asked us to do after we were done with this first tranche of work. Um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> if he'd been a rocket scientist and a brain surgeon, I would have left the building. Um, 
he said, okay, great. Nice work. Thanks for that work. But every car company is going to chase us. What can we do that will make it hard for anybody to catch us? Which is a great question. So I got with my colleague, her name was Andrea, my number two at the time. And uh, we went to Munich and in the elevator on the way up, I said, you know, I'm going to make this guy talk about love. And she said, we're going to get fired. He's a German engineer running a very successful car company. We're lucky to have gotten this far. I said, nah. She said, what are you going to say? And I said, I don't know, but we got to talk about love. She shakes her head and she started kicking me with the toe of her pointy stiletto in the shin, which she would continue doing throughout the meeting. We went into his office and he's got this gorgeous office with a view of Munich. And I don't know how many of you have been to Munich, but it's one of the world's most gorgeous cities. And it was a crystal clear spring day. And uh, he was thanking us for three years of good work and it was good hard work and we did some good stuff. But he said, it's not enough. Everybody's gonna catch us, Volkswagen, Ford. They're all gonna chase us. We wanna get ahead so far that they can't catch us. And we said, easy. Make sustainable development your business model. At this point, Andrea's kicking a hole through my shin with her shoe because she knows I'm making this up because nobody had ever done that before. And uh, he said, well, tell me more. I'm intrigued. I said, Agenda 21, sustainability. It's a thing. And at the time, it was very new. It was, what, 1992 with Agenda 21, the Real Earth Summit, which hopefully all of you know, um, uh, Carrie knows because she was forced to study this stuff at Presidio. But anyway, um, uh, I said, look, I mean, you want to make it so they can't catch you? Make sustainability your business model. He said, well, how? I'm not going to do my German accent, but he had a very thick German accent. Um, he said, how? And I got up to the whiteboard and Andrea did this. Um, because you knew I was making it up. And I said, look, sir, I got to tell you, nobody's done this. I'm about to propose something that I thought about on the flight over with my colleague. I don't know if it's going to work, but here's my theory. And I spun out a theory of change. And when I was done, he said, great. And I said, do you want to talk about what it's going to cost? He said, nah, we've been working with you for four years. Just make it happen. He says, where are you going to start? And I said, at the beginning, he said, what do you mean? I said, your car has come from ideas. Every industrial artifact starts with an idea in the mind part of a designer. We need to start at your design house. He said, well, you want to go to Design Works, which at the time had just been purchased. It was a design studio in Newbury Park, California. They had just bought Design Works. Um, and it's, their, it's now their wholly owned subsidiary, which is one of the most respected design houses in the world. He said, you want to go to Design Works? And I said, yeah. He said, they don't know how to do management systems. They're designers. I said, we're not going to do management systems. We're going to teach them sustainable design. He said, wait a second. You're two lawyers from California. You have a humanities degree. You have a finance degree. And you're going to teach my designers who are world-class designers something new? And at that point, Andrea basically had given up. And she was planning what to do on her vacation because we weren't going to get any more work from these guys. And I said, and I gave him a talk because I thought about this and I gave him the short version of what we ultimately did. To shorten up the lines, we went to Newbury Park, California, and we made sustainable design a thing at Design Works, and the global design industry followed. Today, every design house you look at, from IDEO to Frog to every captive design house inside a company, talks about sustainable design. And it made a difference. Um, if you look at BMW's website, you'll see their way of reporting the results of our work. They have published now for 12 years what they call their sustainable value report. They report to the German stock exchange ecological, social, and economic data sets that demonstrate measurably why they're a leader. I'll give you one example. The 2020 3 Series BMW is 78% old BMWs. The company is eating their own waste. And very few people know this, but it's a fact. And they're doing it in a way that 
every company is trying to copy and they can't. Um, so it worked, it was useful. And now McKinsey and I are about to go to Newbury Park and teach design works about regenerative design. And this is where we come to the real punchline of our work and our talk with you. This kind of work, the work of making peace in a fractured world, the world of making every organization in civil society attend to a regenerative future. The reason that our tagline is the future is regenerative is the sustainability is dead. It's had its day. The system conditions we face, if we stay on this path of sustainable development, nature's gonna extirpate us as a bad experiment. We have one choice to pursue regenerative development. And I'm gonna give you a simple, easy definition that you can hang on to. And again, we're happy to go past the half hour mark and continue this exploration with you. You have a slide deck that includes 24 slides in an appendix that has the details of how you do this work. And you'll be welcome to contact me and Mackenzie and we can talk with, this, with you about how you do this work. But given the time, I'm gonna to come to the punchline. We envision an economy, a global economy, that is configured in the following way. Every transaction, every decision between family members at the community level, at the sub-national, state, county, and provincial level, at the national level, and at the global level. Every single exchange of value generates net measurable simultaneous gains, net measurable simultaneous gains in ecological, social, and economic well-being. If every transaction or decision of every institution in the global human civil society generated net simultaneous measurable gains, in ecological, social, and economic well-being, not profit, and they're different, there's a chance we can jump through the wormhole, reverse gear climate change, solve our social justice crisis, and become not just what America has dreamed of in our constitution, but what the global community said on the day the UN was founded. In the UN charter, it says the following. For the purpose of the future and the children who will follow us in the wake of two world wars, by the way, we commit this day to form an institution designed to make it possible to live peaceably, joyfully, and happily, always on this planet, respecting the needs of everyone. That's a pretty good formula. It would be an idea to follow it someday. So we have a little bit of time for questions within the hour and a half, but I'd like to get maybe a poll, Carrie and Samia, if it's okay, of how many people want to stay, because then we can tune our remarks to accommodate. And if nobody, if everybody has to leave it at, at half six, that's totally fine. But if we know how many people, if any, want to stay, then we can design our further remarks around that. So could we do a quick poll? I'll stay. Yeah, maybe people can just say out loud or, yeah. you, need to, or you can drop okay. it in the chat. No worries, Weston. Thank you for or, coming. I mean, uh, stay on until half six, but yeah, go ahead. The thumbs up is also a good way to just let us know who wants to stick around. I think maybe two, three people as of now. Okay, well, that's enough. That's enough for us to, to keep going. So thank you. Thank you. So Mackenzie, I've been talking way too long. I'm happy to continue. But at this point, is there anything you'd like to add? No, I, I mean, maybe uh, the, the chance to get to work with design works is super amazing. And I honestly did not think I'd be doing this like seven months ago that's when I that's when I joined the foresight lab and now I'm here talking to you all and 
I feel like I've changed so much and um, I'm able to do these things and it's super amazing with, with Ed's help and it's, yeah, it's super awesome. And I'm, and I'm glad you all want to stick around to talk a little bit more about this. Yeah, Mackenzie, thank you for that. Why don't, for context, why don't you tell them some of the contours of what we're going to be doing with the next generation of transformation with DesignWorks and then we'll march forward uh, into some more content? Right. Well, one of the things we want to do is teach a class to their designers on regenerative design, um, just to help them take that next step from sustainable to regenerative. Um, to be able to do that, though, we first have to write a letter to the CEO of BMW himself, um, Zitza, uh, pretty much pleading our case for a partnership and um, Ed is having me write that, which is, I was like, you want me to write this letter? Okay, I'll do it. Um, so, so that's been going really well. Uh, really exciting uh, if, that, if that does get sent to him. And I think Ed liked it. So, so we'll, we'll, see, we'll see how that goes, but um, we're hoping he'll say yes because Holga Homp, who, who we've been communicating and who's Ed has known for like 20 plus years, right, Ed? Yep. Um, he is like the, what is he like the, the manager of he's the, all... head, he's the head of design works globally. Correct. Right. So, um, we've been in communication with him and he was the one who was like, you guys need to write a letter to the CEO of BMW. And I was just like, okay. Um, and then we're also planning on doing a sort of podcast round table with stakeholders and customers, letting them know about regenerative design and why they're wanting to take this next step. Um, so that, that should be super interesting as well. Um, yeah, am I missing anything? No, that's good, that's great. Okay. Thank you. All right, you, if there's no questions, I wanna take some time. Um, yes, of course she needs to write it, I agree. I'm glad you agree. Um, I'd like to go forward a few slides and talk about the Justice Fund at the Open Society Foundations because it goes a bit deeper into the techniques and how this work is done. So if we could go forward, I'll tell you when to stop there, Samia, please. There you go, there you go. Just back up, one more. All right, George Soros funded the Open Society Foundations for the purpose of transforming human society towards a just and verdant future. It's a very well resourced uh, foundation, um, as you might guess. George Soros being behind it. And they have 12 programs. One of them is the Justice Fund. We were commissioned when I was in Rios to undertake a problem set. And if you go to the next slide, I'll describe it. Um, you'll know that this is a problem. Um, so it's your job when you approach this work to have a take, to have a hypothesis, to have a starting place. The question is always, where do we start? Um, and at about three or four minutes till seven, I will tell you how we're gonna start to fix our national soul and address this problem of social justice once and for all and stop failing at doing it. But you have to have a theory. You have to have a theory of change. And our theory of change was, we sort of stroked our chins over at Rios. My colleague, Mille Bedet, who ran the, um, Rio de Janeiro office of Rios and I were out front on this one. And so we thought about it and had a strokey beard meeting with ourselves. And we said, hmm, what if every dollar that a state spent on youth incarceration of youth of color were spent on education programs? What would happen? So we first had to figure out how much was being spent. Not hard. We were a house of research as well. Um, and we thought, well, we better pick states where if we find something interesting, we have a chance of running a prototype. So we did some research and some colleagues did some research and we partnered with my old institution, the Institute for the Future, to do a survey of the 50 states. And after some analysis, we picked California and New Jersey as states which at the time, which was 2012, we thought were progressive enough to give it a try if we ran our hypothesis and we came up with something that was useful enough to try as a prototype. Well, we did the analysis and we concluded just by using the techniques that McKinsey talked about from limits to growth, 
we did a extrapolated progression model and we said, let's take those dollars and put them into a little formula. That one of the genius computer programmers, I'm a humanities major, I got nowhere near this thing uh, set up. And if we spent the money on education, what would pop out the other end? And then we did all the, we looked at the globe, we did a global scan of the research on what happens when you take youth of color in a country um, and put them through an education program. And if you go to the next slide, we came to the conclusion that, yeah, it might work. So there's an equation. The work we do blends three tool sets, complexity science, systemics, and diplomacy. The skills of these three disciplines are how we do our work. Uh, it's an evolution of Rios, which uses brilliant regenerative diplomacy, but we added systemic thinking and complexity to do Rios one better, which is saying something since Adam is a genius and Rios does brilliant work. And if you've never been to their website, you should take a look, um, rios.com. Uh, sorry, riospartners.com is the website. Um, so we ran the equation we took complexity, added systemics, multiplied by regenerative diplomacy, which is how you deliver a solution set. And we thought it would work. So we got in touch with the departments of corrections in New Jersey and California. And we said, you know, we've done this thing. And the Justin, Justice Fund is the kind of place where if you call the Department of Corrections in a state, they call you back. So um, the head of the program called and we had a meeting with the head of the Department of Corrections, social justice groups and other civil society organizations in both states. And we said, look, we have a theory. And we showed them what we had come up with. And the short version is, God bless them, they both tried it on a pilot basis. Today, in New Jersey and California, youth of color are diverted from the incarceration system and put in to education programs that is meant to taught them, teach them one of three things, an honorable trade, prepare them for university, or to help them get a job that is a job. I mean, a way to make progress in their lives and earn a living. But the higher aims are to teach them an honorable trade or get them into university. Not everybody's made for university, we need to respect the honorable trades and create a situation where, you know, we can have a diversity of useful uh, undertakings. Um, because we looked at the problem, you're, you're very welcome. Thank you for, for coming. Um, because we looked at the problem every which way, we saw two risks in doing this. And they're the same risks you face every time you try to do cultural transformation. It's a simple formula. When you're trying to do more than just pass laws, when you're trying to do more than just do more training, when you're trying to do more than just frost a broken inedible cake in a frosting that looks delicious, you need two things, political will and social knowledge. Every movement of social conscience in our history, and I speak now, forgive me, those of you who weren't from the United States, but I'll, I'll speak about the United States for just a moment, although we're all citizens of the world, hopefully, from the revolution to the exercise of democracy in our streets that we're seeing right now around social justice, the formula has been the same. Political will and social knowledge. You've got to build those. That's a longer story. We'll get into some of that in the, in the remainder of our half hour together. And again, thanks for those of you who are sticking with us. Um, the political will in this instance came from telling the governors at the time who were both very progressive and, uh, and smart, this is gonna help you with your demographic. There's a political case, but fortunately they were also moral people. And we said, it's the right thing to do. And furthermore, the data tells us and our extrapolations say it's gonna work. The political will came about because they both have brilliant communication departments. 
So the communication departments and the um, departments of corrections collaborated. Um, and in the event, they transformed their programs. And to date, three other states have copied and they're sort of getting there, but the road is long. But as I said before, in the words of Dr. King, the moral arc of justice always bends back. And in the fullness of time, we believe this will propagate, especially if we can drop it into the national um, conversation. And we'll talk about the national conversation in a minute because of the moment that we're in. If we stop and take a pause and sit back in our chairs and remember what's going on outside of our doors and windows, um, it's rough out there. It's a time. And we're conscious that we're doing our work at a time when it's never been tougher to just have a life, much less do social and cultural transformation. So applauds to all of you for pursuing difficult PhDs at a time when challenging PhDs at a really good school at a time when it's hard to just get groceries. So I just wanna say that, good on all of you. Um, so um, it worked, but I feel obliged to get into some of the granular detail um, since we've got you still with us. So if we could scroll forward a few slides, we're gonna talk a little bit. Um, let's go on, uh, we'll come back to that. Let's go on. All right, this is one of three skill sets and we're gonna talk a little bit about this, but before I go on, um, Mackenzie, we're gonna talk a little bit about how the four of these work together. And this is relevant to the course you're taking, which you can explain to the colleagues in a minute. But after I'm done laying these out, I'd like you to talk about what it looks like to do this work with a patron. And without mentioning the names of our patrons, maybe you can think while I give this initial excursus about some of the work we're actually doing with some of our nonprofit patrons around this. Um, and you can give some real tangible examples maybe of this um, approach that I'm gonna describe. If you would think about that, please. Um, all right, so there's four um, gestures in this rhetoric set. And we define our terms. One of the things that I used to love to do at Presidio that Carrie will remember is I would make students talk about their work and their life and the things they did in my capstone class without using the word sustainability because it makes you inarticulate when you use jargon. I know I'm a licensed California and European lawyer who make their living generally on using jargon to confuse people and buy big houses. I'm sorry, that's a little harsh, but you know, I mean, lawyering is lawyering, especially in the United States. Um, we should be forced to define regenerative development, which I did. We have a very specific meaning. If you're gonna use a word repeatedly, tell people what you mean. It's diplomacy, be clear. We learned that in third grade. We use imagination in a particular way. We think about it as a unique skill. The imagination has to be honed, sharpened, refined, practiced, and nothing like a personal practice. And what I can say that in this group, and all of you know exactly what I mean. Imagine if I'm in a Midwest aerospace company and I say, how's your personal practice? I mean, I have silvery antenna, I come from another planet, but here I can say, if you have a personal practice, you can refine your imagination. I recommend you do so and try to think about it perhaps in these terms. The idea of a plastic picture is simple. It's just a flexible picture that you can move around in your head. Obviously, there's a reason why cognitive scientists say imagination is the core of creativity, um, but there's more. Inspiration, we talk about all the time. What do we mean when we say inspiration? Well, we mean exactly this. You don't get inspiration when you breathe out. You bring in the energy, life, truth, and yes, moral justice of the world and our ancestors when you breathe in. And whenever we breathe in, we have a renewed sense of it's possible to live another few heartbeats. Personal practice. 
refining and honing the skill. Next slide, please. Um, some people call it going with your gut, um, a hunch. There's this wonderful word, inkling, which is a beautiful word. It kind of glitters across your tongue when you say the word inkling. I have an inkling this might work. Intuition. But it exists and lives in a particular way when you do this work. Because we think too much. We are bound by our cultural constructs. These days, the hackneyed grammar that's used is, what's your privilege? Or what's the other one, Mackenzie? Um, unconscious bias. I mean, we got to be conscious of these things, and it's great. Unfortunately, there's consultants out there selling this stuff in a heuristic way, making money, not making any difference, because it's heuristic. We know we're losing when this gets in the hands of consultants and they start selling it to companies for money. If that's happening, they're doing it wrong, which is why we don't do that kind of work. We're not consultants, we're creative agents. And there's a big difference. Intuition lives in a certain place where you drop the thinking, you let go of cultural constructs and you become deeply human and you feel and you listen and you're quiet. There were times during those two weeks in Minneapolis where I said, everyone be quiet. And it was awkward until they practiced it. There was one point on the third day we were there where we had proposed how they approach a certain press conference they had to have. And we proposed, because we're counterfactual, 180 degrees off of what they wanted to do. The details don't matter. We were arguing, which is the opposite of diplomacy. Diplomacy consists of one thing at the end of the day, colleagues, getting people who despise each other who yesterday were shooting each other at each other with guns to recognize the humanity in the other people at the table. You don't do that by talking, which is why we gave you the aphorisms we sent you, by the way. Those little quotes and the prompts that we gave you, those are truths taken mostly from the catechism of Adam Kahane and his colleagues with a nice sprinkling of Rumi and a brilliant definition of culture by our national ecological poet laureate, um, Wendell Berry. If we have time, we can dig into that. But his definition of culture is spot on. I commend it to you. We use it every single day, whether we're working on the internal culture of um, an organization or proposing big heartedly, and some would say with great temerity to change the culture of our country. Anyway, intuition, it's a thing. We learn every day in this agency. We don't have answers, we have approaches. We don't have solutions, we have interventions. We don't have expertise, we have notions. We have useful starting places. For years, I've been talking about the three eyes. Intuition, imagination, these are important. They're critical. And so is inspiration. But McKinsey and I recently learned from a patron that there's a fourth eye. And he's really smart. He's done some really important work in the world, this gentleman. He still is. His nonprofit that we're advising is doing some of the most important work in the country at the intersection of food and social justice. And he said, yeah, your three eyes are cool, but there's a fourth eye. And this is a lesson for us all. The day you stop learning and innovating in the field while you're doing the hard work is the day your work stops working. So thank goodness he gave us a fourth eye to think about. So we had to give it a definition and I did. And maybe it's right, Mackenzie will help me make it better in the fullness of time as will our other colleagues, but, um, this is a thing because our job, brothers and sisters, is to hold the space 
of the most difficult, painful, agonizing, awkward, uncomfortable conversations that humanity has ever had. Because if we do that, just like Adam Kahane set up on the hill at the Montfilier process, we have a chance not to fix, not to legislate, but to heal. So these are the four, you know, sort of core gestures of regenerative diplomacy. It's at the heart of our degree program of a master of science and peace and reconciliation studies. It's how we propose to fix this country. This little outfit, the, the Foresight Lab, has approached um, the folks who are likely to win this election and given them a formula to apply Montfleur again, to create a new national department in the United States of culture and heritage, to pass a law, to create a truth and reconciliation commission for this country and to open up the wounds of 400 years of everything from slavery to the othering of people who choose to live and love different people to the way women are treated to all the other social ills we have. If we do that, and we open up our wounds for two years and have a national conversation, there's a chance that if we then hand it over to a permanent federal department of culture and heritage, that we can fix this. And if we don't do just that, there's every chance we're gonna to continue to fail. And I'll close by saying that the inspiration of the next generation represented by all of you and Mackenzie and the wisdom of our elders, that's everybody from Adam Kahane to those wonderful desert gods of my mothers and fathers that whisper, whisper to me in the early dawn when I'm out in the Sonoran absorbing the energy of our history. Those are the tools, brothers and sisters. Find your heart, find your history, open yourself to these ideas. The things we talk about in the hippie upper left coast that the rest of the country and much of the world don't get are the tools of transformation that stand between us and extirpation. And I just wanna say a hearty thank you to one of my favorite and most brilliant students ever, Ms. Carrie Crisp and her wonderful colleague, Samia, for inviting us. And again, I can never stop thanking Mackenzie Mako enough for her work and her, inspir her inspiring abilities um, and to all of you for listening. And with that, we'll close and just open the floor. And um, we'd love to hear in the next few minutes, questions, comments, challenges um, from any and all of you. I, I've got some general questions, I guess, um, if I can ask. Uh, so before I decided to you know, come to CIS and learn philosophy in the PCC program, um, you know, I did some, uh, I was a neurophysiology researcher as well as a, a psychiatrist. I have an MD and, um, you know, so, something that is becoming apparent as I'm trying to synthesize, uh, not only what you're talking about, but also just, you know, what I'm learning in, uh, so far at PCC as well is, um, how to, how to dispel some of the social fears, I guess, that, uh, you know, because you know, this, this way of application, um, I mean, it, it's great, but at the individual level, um, people, especially of, you know, sort of privilege and political power have fears of, of losing things. You know, they, they have fears of losing some of their convenience. They have fears of losing possessions, maybe even territory, you know, uh, there, there's a lot of things that people, um, ha, you know, of privilege especially, have a fear uh, of losing, which, which then kind of turns into uh, the directions of their political votes and, and uh, where they put their capital and things like that too. So uh, what, what are some of the details that, that you might help dispel fear with? Wow, what a great question. Uh, McKinsey, you want first dibs or you want me to go first? You got it. All right. Um, 
You're gonna have to clean up when I'm done though. Um, there is a philosopher. Uh, I can talk about philosophers. I have a philosophy degree. There's a bunch of philosophers in the audience. I love this. Mackenzie's boyfriend is a philosopher. I mean, you know, we couldn't be happier. Um, his name is Umberto Maturana. He comes from Chile. He's one of these amazing, um, we're gonna send you a raft of readings afterwards. You don't have to write it down. Our catechism at the lab includes his brilliant book, Autopoiesis. Um, so we're gonna send you a raft of stuff that you can think about afterward. Maturana is a uh, polytechnic thinker, which is why CIS is so excellent. You guys blend non-linear disciplines together to make brilliant degree programs. Um, Maturana says that I was right in the elevator that day when I was with Andrea. Now he doesn't say that exactly because he doesn't know me, although I would love to know him. Um, but he says the following, only in love can we be fully human and release our creativity in ways that imagine possible futures yet undreamt of, which are required if we are to make our society only in love. If you're fearful of anything, as you know, from, am I gonna to spend too much on this grapefruit to, am I gonna say the wrong thing in this conference room after the terrible thing that happened on 31st May? If you're fearful, you lose, the game is over. If you proceed from fear and the sense of um, losing, um, the game is over. So my advice, the technique is twofold. I'm just going to be with Buddha for a sec. Surrender the, the material realities around you and find only your soul. Um, this is all passing. This is all, all the artifacts, this amazing arrogance we have that McKinsey's talked about so beautifully that has built an economy that basically consists so we can buy huge boxes to stuff with crap to distract us and give to our kids so we can keep doing this over and over again until nature says, that was bad. We're going to try lizards now because humans, not so much. Um, if you find love, if you can be in love when faced with crisis, which we all do, right? Right now, unfortunately, all of us are having to deal with this. And we can face the crises around us from a place of fear and desperation or love. If you can turn your heart and just in the darkest moments, I will just tell you that what I do, this may or may not work for you, is I think of my kids. I picture their faces. I think of Mackenzie and our other colleagues. I picture them. When I'm stuck, when I don't know what to do, when I have an impossible task, like walking into that conference room, I conjure. That's how I find love. You may do something different. You may need to do uh, an aphorism. You may have to meditate. Find love in your heart at the place where your heart and your soul inform your will. Find love in your heart at the place when your heart and your soul inform your will. And if you do that, you can exert your will into the world and you can hold space for the toughest conversations you need to have with a loved one, with a parent, or with presidents of two countries who want to annihilate each other and find a way to imagine a future that nobody could imagine before you found love. I hope that's not too glib. No, that, that makes a lot of sense because that can't help but, you know, be sort of a, a, of a light that will shine upon other people, I, I would hope, if, if you come from that with, with sincerity in your heart. You know, that makes perfect sense. Great question, Josh. Great question. Someone else? You know, I have a, I don't want to, I don't want to come in the way of anyone else's question, but I have a I have a dying question, so if it's okay, uh, and it's Lindsay, um, you know, in, in PCC Philosophy, Cosmology, and Consciousness, our, our department, we talk a lot about the shadow, and we recognize that everything and every human being has a shadow. Um, I love truth and re reconciliation. I've been to South Africa. I worked in the townships there, and and really saw the reality of, of South Africa today and that it's still nowhere near where it should be. Um, I'm also deepening my relationship to my heritage in India through Gandhi, uh, you know, really, really 
amazing to see how he led the country to independence through nonviolence. But India has currently the highest rate of rape and South Africa has the highest rate of, of crime. And so how, how do you think we can, as we utilize these, um, these ways of, 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 of uh, enabling peace and justice, how do we face the shadow? How do we, how do we recognize what may be on the other side? Wow, boy, I so want to teach a degree program to you guys. These are fantastic questions. Um, uh, let me approach it this way. The shadow has a form behind it that casts the shadow. That form is fear. The shadow is only on you, the dark side of those realities is grounded in this idea of fear. And I'll tell you something that Oscar Arias says in his book, um, Waging Peace. Uh, it's a brilliant um, short truth. He said, every human conflict from an argument between lovers to war between nations is grounded on unmet human need. I mean, that's all I need to go and wage peace. I need that little sentence from page 122 of his book. So if you know that, then the shadow becomes not your enemy, but true to spirits of Aikido, the shadow becomes your ally. Because the momentum of the shadow, if used against darkness with a view to what's the unmet human need that's throwing that shadow, you can't erase it, it's not easy. It will take decades for India to address the problem of rape. It will take decades for South Africa to drive corruption out of its government. But the fact that those two nation states are there and that that night in, uh, ironically, South Africa, when Mohandas Gandhi said to his friends, brothers, because they were all men that night, we will take the jackboot of the most powerful country on earth off the necks of our people and we will do it peacefully. You know what they said? They said, Mohandas, you need better medication. That's never going to work. But it did because he gritted his teeth and went back home, gave up his South African law practice and changed the world by conjuring what's the unmet human need. I hope that's useful. I mean, these are big questions and I can never hope to usefully, I'm sorry, we can never hope to usefully respond in the time we have. But you know what we have? Nothing but time and everything to gain. We have two minutes left by my clock. Anybody else? Carrie, I've never heard you be this quiet. I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> yeah, I don't think we're having an honest enough conversation in society about kind of the problems that we're up against because in about 20, 30 years from now, we're going to have 10 billion people on the planet. And yeah, regenerative economy sounds amazing, but I don't think we're having an honest enough conversation about what actually needs to die and what does the hospicing process look like to deal with that. And that is absolutely part of peace and justice and reconciliation. What are we going to do with all these companies who cannot possibly regenerate because it's just, it's really not going to happen. And I don't see people talking about that. I mean, oh my goodness, uh, Mrs. Vasquez, that's amazing. Um, so Mackenzie, I've been talking a lot. That's a great question. You're taking a class right now where we're exploring these issues. Do you have a take on how we shepherd away the old and invite in the new and hospice away the predatory, rapacious economy and invite in the human regenerative one? Yeah, that's a big question. Um, I mean, it's, you can't just do this work in one sector. It has to be cross sectoral. So like agriculture businesses, so like nonprofits, for profits, NGOs, um, 
the government in and of itself, uh, societal changes, changes within your own household, it, it has to be everywhere all at once, um, which is a, a big task for sure. And it won't be done in a day. Um, but I mean, I believe it can be done and it needs to be done. Um, Cause that's, that's I mean, a great start. Yeah. That's a great yeah. start. Mackenzie. I mean, the horrifying um, scientific reports that many of us in this group are reading is like, we basically have about 10 years to figure this out. That's exactly. Yeah. That's what we said at the top of the, at the top of the class. Exactly. So let me try and build on Mackenzie's useful intervention there. Um, Carrie, cause it's, it's may, in some, oh, sorry. May I have a request? Since, yes. regenerative, since regenerative is a prominent feature I would even say defining aspect of the paradigm. Can you marry the two <laughs> in your uh, in your in 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 your kind of you know uh, contribution? Ed? what I'm saying is, if Mackenzie is talking about sectors of change, and I always see them at the intersection of individual, collective, formal, and informal, and Casey is talking about uh, you know hospicing what needs to go. Where does the regenerative aspect, granted, I don't know much, but you no, that's are- great. That's most, a great- yeah. How does the regenerative aspect fit within, within what two of them have just brought up? That's amazing, because that's kind of where I was going to go. So nice work. Uh, we might need to talk, Violetta. Um, but here's the thing. It's a brilliant question. Thank you, Mackenzie and Violetta, and all of you for the energy that brought that question forward. Here's what I think, and this is just a, a beginning of an answer that will end our night together. Um, nature is very wise. Like so many good things in life, our practice is biomimetic. There are big dinosaur companies running around this world doing what they've always done. And an asteroid has hit in the form of climate change. They can adapt or die. They must. We don't have to hospice. I mean, look at peak oil. If companies who run the oil sector don't stop, they're going to lose value. And as Barons and Meadows and Meadows and company predicted, they'll go. We don't have to do anything but wait. What we must do while that hospicing takes care of itself is build the second lane, a regenerative economy. And it's starting. I'm going to give you reason for wonderful hope by telling you my favorite regenerative business story. Uh, it'll take three minutes and I apologize for going over. I met a young entrepreneur who ran a successful uh, restaurant that I loved in San Luis Obispo one day through a mutual friend. And he said, I wanna start a business that does good in the world. This is 2003. I said, that's great, so does everybody, what's new? I'm sorry, at that point, I was a little bit jaded. Um, and he said, no, 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 I want to do something that does good. I want to really, really do good. And I said, how much? He said, I'm wealthy now. I can do a lot. And I know a lot about a few things. I said, what do you know the most about? He said, well, I know about tea. More specifically, I know about mate, which is the specific kind of tea drunk by the indigenous people in the high country of the Andes at the place where Brazil meets Argentina. I said, how much do you know? And he told me a lot. I said, that's great. Let's get a scientist to talk to us about how mate grows. And let's get a, uh, a cultural specialist who tells us why the people of those places have drunk mate for centuries. Let's understand it at a deep level. And the short version is, he decided to build a company that would follow the formula that I was just thinking of back then. I taught a class before I went to Presidio called Thriving Regenerative Enterprise. It's something called the Green MBA. And I was exploring the idea of a business that would create net simultaneous measurable gains in ecological, social, and economic well-being. He said, I wanna use that formula. I want that to be my business model. I said, okay, here's how you do it. And we spent two years ideating. He spent a lot of money. I spent a lot of time. We had a group of brilliant colleagues and he figured out a business that would do social justice and ecological restoration with every single sale. 
that business is Guayaquil. That guy is Chris Mann. And this being the upper left coast, I'm guessing most of you know that product. Chris has invested in the time since he founded that company in creating 120,000 hectares of rainforest regeneration. And he gave jobs of dignity and purpose to about 4,000 people who at the time had two choices, poverty or joining the drug trade. So every time you buy a bottle or glass or shot of yerba mate made by Guayaquil with that beautiful little heart-shaped logo and that gorgeous little yellow can, you are buying embedded social justice and ecological restoration. They're ingredients of the product. It's the only truly regenerative business on the planet, but it's the business model of the future. And as sure as we're sitting here tonight, sharing our time and energy and space and spirit. If enough companies follow that model, three things will happen. Boatloads of money will be made creating an economy that is regenerative. Social justice will be a part of every company's value prop and ecological restoration will be a mandate by law. So I'm glad that we can end by answering Carrie's question in a way that responds to Violetta and hopefully gives us a reason for hope. And I'll just say a big giant capital N namaste to my colleagues and to uh, Carrie and Sami and to all of you for your time tonight. Thank you, Adam McKenzie. Yes, thank you thank so much for working tonight. And thank we'll you. We'll be sending you some follow-up materials. You all have a good rest of your week. Thank you so much.